Today is the 17th, St. Patrick's Day. Oh, I don't have it. Um, we're taking a special offering for the Trenton Food Pantry at St. Philip's Church. The flowers on the altar were given by Lynn Lash in honor of her husband, Ben, La ben Lash's birthday. And uh, I want to change, we're having, a, we're having a potluck afterwards. You're invited even if you didn't bring food. But the special viewing of the St. John in Exile, the DVD featuring Je Jean Jones, which is a 92 minute video, I'm bumping that to Thursday, okay? So if you're, if, if it's a really good dramatic presentation of the, of the gospel. It's a one-man show. It's, Saint, it's, it's, it's him as, uh, as the disciple John in his, in his later life, and it's an amazing dramatic presentation. And then next, next Sunday is Palm Sunday already, hard to believe. So with that, I think everyone got the change, the... DVD to Thursday at 6:30. Well, I'll, we'll serve uh, not. We won't serve dinner, but it'll be dessert and snacks, and um, and should be. It's a wonderful film. I commend it to you. So those of you, I'm doing this because some of you don't have DVD players anymore, and uh, we do. We don't have cable, and uh, so that's what we do. Uh, okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol uh, to prepare our hearts as we with some music as we lift our hearts to God. Good morning. Good morning. Let us praise God. Let us praise the one who has filled the earth with blessings. Let us sing to our creator who has filled our lives with joy. Even, Even when, when sorrows, sorrows befall us and troubles besiege us, we live supported by God's love. All praise be to our God, Father, Son, Son and, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Please stand if you are able for our first hymn. It's on page 157 and on the screen.
So I didn't uh, have time to look up St. Patrick's Lorica, Lorica, so I just, uh, for an opening prayer, but I uh, turned to 2166, and there are some of the words of St. Patrick's Lorica or, or, or noted here as a breastplate part of his prayer. So let us, let us pray. I don't, I'm not asking you to turn to it. Just be with me in prayer where he is focuses of Christ. May Christ be beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, King of my heart, Christ within me, Christ below me, Christ above me, never to part. Christ on my right hand, Christ on my left hand, Christ all around me, shield in the strife. Christ in my sleeping, Christ in my sitting, Christ in my rising, light of my life. Lord Jesus, live in us through the Holy Spirit and guide us in this hour, we pray, as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth, with joy and enthusiasm. We pray in your precious and powerful name, O Lord. Amen. Please uh, join me in turning to the back of your hymnal to page 785 that we might join in the responsive reading of Psalm 51, page 785, a Psalm of David, as the, uh, the flavor of a prayer of confession. So let us consider it that and and read it with that in mind. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and done that which is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity, and I have been sinful since my mother conceived. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being, and therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with this sentence, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your holy spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Amen. I turn now to the brief reading from uh, the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 31, uh, 31 through 34. Uh, verses which are highlighted in Acts chapter 1 and 2 as being fulfilled uh, on the day of Pentecost and from there on. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their heart, in their minds, and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. I invite you to turn in the faith we sing uh, hymnal. And Diane, are you up for coming to lead us in this? I think this was the one I asked you to do. I'm going to ask Carol to, it's been a while since we sang this one. And uh, I'm going to ask Carol to play the tune through for us once. 
before we sing 20, 2016 in the in the black book Go on, do it. I, I took her lesson, so she's going to take mine. Okay, go for it. <laughs> <clears throat> she's prepared for both. Yes, I am. I know my Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> the gospel lesson is taken from John 12. Starts with verses, verse 20 and goes to verse 34. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it, said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, 
so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. I'm going to ask Carol to uh, play the tune for our uh, 2887, We Will Glorify the King of Kings through once before we join in singing it together, just to refresh our memory. Another one we haven't sung, sung in a while. It was Passover time in Jerusalem, and some Greeks, meaning some non-Jewish Greek-speaking people, not necessarily from Greece, approached Jesus' disciple Philip's, perhaps because he had a Greek name. They expressed a desire to meet Jesus, and they, would, they may have been uncertain just how Jesus would react to their request. Now, just to set the stage, Jesus had just entered the city with, of Jerusalem with much acclaim, an event we will celebrate next week on Palm Sunday. And just before that triumphant entrance, Jesus had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. Perhaps the adulation of the crowd and the news of Jesus' many miracles had, had piqued the curiosity of those non-Jews about Jesus. They may have even been what was called God-fearers who, who worshipped the God of Israel but hadn't officially converted to Judaism. Now, John's gospel does not tell us if they ever got to meet Jesus. Instead, we hear Jesus declare, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, by which he meant in part that it was his time to die on the cross. But in John's gospel, Jesus' crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, his, and, and his exaltation to God the Father's side in heaven, after his resurrection, are all considered part of his glorification. Although we are more likely to see Jesus' agonizing death on a cross after being brutally tortured as his humiliation, not his glorification. However, the fact that Jesus was referring to his death as part of his glorification is supported by the fact that Jesus immediately started talking about his sacrificial death in metaphorical terms as a grain of wheat that would bear much fruit. Jesus emphasized his words by saying, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Earlier, as recorded in John chapter 10, Jesus had described himself as the good shepherd who would lay down his life for his sheep. And then right after that, he said, I have other sheep too that are not in this sheepfold. I, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, and they will be one flock with one shepherd. For the majority of his earthly ministry, Jesus had focused most of his attention on preaching and teaching and healing among his own people, the Jews. But most scholars think that the other sheep Jesus was referring to in John chapter 10 were non-Jews. And now with these Greeks seeking to meet him, Jesus apparently took that as a sign that the hour had come for him to lay down his life for the world 
in dying for all of our sins, the sins of Jews and non-Jews alike, taking the punishment for them on the cross in his death. John Beasley Murray contends, and I quote, the reply of Jesus indicates the coming of the Gentiles heralds the climax of his ministry. The hour has at last arrived, and it will witness his glorification. It will be time for the Gentiles to come under the saving sovereignty of God, which is another way of saying that they, it's now time for them to be included in the kingdom of God. Friends, it, it was only after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven that the, that the fullness of the gospel could be preached because it was only in Christ's death on the cross for our sins that, God, that, that our salvation was won. And it was only in Christ's resurrection and ascension that God proved that he had accepted God the Son's sacrifice on our behalf and restored him to the place of glory and honor that Jesus had enjoyed before even the world had begun. Eternal life. Eternal life, according to Jesus in John's gospel, is only available to us through faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, who died for us as our Savior and Lord and was raised to life again for our salvation. To quote Beasley Murray once again, so surely as a grain of wheat must be buried if it is to yield fruit for men, so the Son of Man must give himself in death if he is to produce a harvest of life for the world. End quote. Nevertheless, when Jesus said just a few minutes later, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, referring to his, his being lifted up on the cross, will draw all men to myself, that does not mean that everyone in the world will be saved. On this point, D.A. Carson correctly notes, and I quote, all men, here uh, in uh, the translation that Lynn Lynn read, it said, all people, all men, all people means all people without distinction, Jews and Gentiles alike, not all individuals without exception, since the surrounding context has just established judgment as a major theme. Certainly, there was a note of judgment and warning when Jesus said in that passage, Lynn read, those who love their life will lose it. But we'll come back to that. First, let's listen again as Jesus considers the, the prospect of his upcoming torture and death. He admits that he is deeply troubled, and he struggles with whether he can, whether he can ask God to spare him by praying, Father, save me from this hour. The Greek word that, that is translated troubled indicates, I'm, I read, uh, indicates an agitation, a, a horror, a convulsion, a, a shock of spirit. And so I think that we should take seriously the fact that Jesus actually struggled before being able to say in prayer, no, it was for this very hour, for this very reason that I came to this hour, adding, Father, glorify your name. This is the closest that John's gospel comes to talking about Christ's anguish in, you know, over his upcoming death because John's gospel gives us no account of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his arrest as Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospels do. Yet in John chapter 12, we hear Jesus coming to the same firm and courageous conviction to do his Father's will and dying on the cross for us, no matter how difficult and painful it will be. And after, after Jesus said, Father, glorify your name, God himself spoke, spoke his approval from heaven to tell his beloved son, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. You see, my friends, God God's name was glorified in everything that Jesus said and did in obedience to, God, to his Father God's will, which was everything that Jesus said and did. And all the amazing miracles that Jesus performed as this God, Son of God, Son of Man figure glorified God. But by, by his upcoming death on the cross would glorify God 
even more. And how was that possible? Because Christ's death on the cross demonstrated the awesome power and extent of God's, God's redeeming love, his deep love for humanity, and of God the Son, Jesus Christ's love for us too, as well as Christ's obedient love for his Father. Besides, as this scripture and others tell, Christ's death on the cross, according to Jesus, was the means by which Satan would be judged, condemned, and driven out from the world, his power over us broken. Christ's victory over the devil on the cross glorified God and, of course, reflected some of that glory back on himself, even though it may look like defeat. It was, in fact, victory. Personally, I like Rudolf Schnackenberg's comments on Jesus' prayer to God, Father, glorify your name. Schnackenberg in, explains, and I quote, It is really a plea that God's plan be carried out, for the name that, that the Father has entrusted to the Son can only be glorified when its bearer is glorified through death, resurrection, and ascension. Only then will people come to realize that the divine name, I am, mean, what, it, what that means when applied to Jesus. End quote. Of course, with the divine name, I am, which Jesus used on several occasions, Jesus declared himself to be God, God incarnate in human flesh, walking among us. Remember how Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Or when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Or when I am the bread of the world. Or when he said, I am the light of the world. Or as I said just early, minutes earlier, I am the good shepherd. In Jesus on the cross, we see God the Son suffering the punishment for his own creature's sin. God himself bearing the punishment in our place for our wrongdoing and rebellion. It is only after Jesus was obedient unto death that he was able to return to heaven to enjoy the glory that he had with God before the world began. But you may ask, okay, what does all of this have to do with me besides being the means of my salvation in order to satisfy the demands of a holy God who demands punishment for sin. Well, in John chapter 12, Jesus tells us all that we must follow his example of self-denying sacrificial love. John's gospel does not record Jesus as saying, as recorded in Mark chapter 8, verse 34 and 35, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and the gospel will save it. For what good does it do for a person to gain the whole world, but forfeit his soul? But John's gospel does record Jesus as saying something very similar to that in John chapter 12, verse 25 and 26, where he declared, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who despise their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. All those who want to be my disciples must come and follow me because my servant must be where I am. And if they follow me, the Father will honor them. That was the translation from the New Living Bible. As Raymond Brown points out, in both traditions, both John and the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the saying about following Jesus is a call for a willingness to imitate Jesus in suffering and death, end quote. My friends, it's not that we are to literally hate or despise our lives on this earth. According to any, all the scholars I've read, that's just a Hebrew way of saying that we to, are to a value, we are to value our relationship to God through Jesus Christ and are serving him above all other earthly claims and pleasures. F.F. F. Bruce explains it like this. 
and John, about John chapter 12. To love one's life here means to give priority to it over the interests of God's kingdom, end quote. And Jesus implies that if we do that, that we will lose out on eternal life because he said those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus, however, does promise that if we follow him and serve him, that God will honor us too. And eventually we will be where he is and where is he now in heaven. So the truth is that, that Jesus calls people of all ages and nationalities and and through the ages to follow him and put the interests interest of his kingdom before our own interests or those of our country or even our family. Just like Jesus struggled with the prospect of death, we struggle with putting to death our desire to be first and to take care of ourselves and our families without considering what Jesus may be calling us to do. And that may be part of what Jesus is calling us to do, but not all of it. It's easy for us to be casual Christians rather than serious disciples of Jesus who make the demands of the gospel, the, the central principle, the, the key motivation of our life. Of course, sometimes our following of Jesus involves sacrifices that don't require real suffering, but rather just require sacrifices of our time, our energy or money or other resources in order to be able to serve Christ in this world and to spread his message of God's love for us in word and deed. Christ Jesus calls each one of us to generous living and giving, to open-hearted loving and sincere forgiving of both friend and enemy alike. Jesus is still glorified. God the Father is still glorified when we live in obedience to God's word and Christ's commands, and care for the poor and the oppressed like Jesus did. Christ is still glorified when we extend God's amazing grace to people we consider our enemies, just as Jesus did to us as sinners. Friends, through the prophet Jeremiah, God promised his people that there would come a time when he would write his law on our hearts so that we would know the Lord and be able to live according to how God would have us live. And that promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is fulfilled when we believe in Jesus Christ and are given that gift of the Holy Spirit. But the truth is we still must submit our will to God's will, daily, if not hourly, if not minute by minute, and it will be the Holy Spirit who can help us to do that so that we can truly follow Jesus and serve him and be where he is working on earth so that one day we will follow him to heaven. That is our Christian mission. That is what it means to be disciple. And that is a holy and hard task. So let us pray. Holy Spirit, help us. Jesus, help us. Help us to follow you in faith and trust and obedience. Show us where and how you want us to serve you in this time and place. And Lord, help us to love you as we should. Draw us closer to you day by day. For we pray in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I invite you now to turn in your hymnal and as well as the screen to hymn number 413. We will stand to sing A Charge to Keep We Have, which I believe is written by John Wesley's brother, Charles Wesley. A charge to keep.
Let us be in prayer. Gracious God, we pray that you would be with um, Paulette's surgeon and, and surgical team tomorrow to guide the surgery on her wrist so that everything might go well. And we pray for her smooth, re and, and smooth recovery from the injury, the broken wrist that she suffered. Surround her with your love, O oh Lord. And we pray for your love to, and your blessing and your support to be with, with the family of Don Batson, family and friends of Don Batson in, in his recent death and, and their grief, as well as with Melda's family and friends, the friends, uh, family of, of Larry, her nephew. We pray that you would be powerfully present to them with your love and support in these last days of his life here on earth. And Lord, we lift up to you all those who are struggling with illness, um, including Craig Davis, who is going to have surgery on April 2nd, and, and all those folks on our list who are in need of your, of your healing, your help, your, and the, their family and friends and caregivers as well as we seek to surround those folks with our love and support. And we know, Lord, that you are the great physician and can do beyond what any human doctor or nurse or medicine can do. And so we pray that your will would be done for them and for us. And Lord, in this day, we, we also pray your blessing upon this congregation that you and your church universal, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and your church so that we might be empowered to be your disciples in a, in a more committed and meaningful way. Help us, Lord, because we are so very human and so very focused sometimes on ourself rather than on you. So be with us, Lord, and help us through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for peace, peace in the Middle East, Help for all those who are suffering from violence in Gaza and the Ukraine and elsewhere around the world. We pray for help for all those who are hungry and hurting and homeless. For those who are lacking the basic necessities of life. Touch our hearts and the hearts of those who, who have so much more power than we do so that resources may be more justly shared. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lynn will lead us in the offertory prayer. God of abundance, sometimes we have to learn how to have faith. When there doesn't seem to be enough, show us how your people take care of each other. When we fear to share what we have, Show us the grace of receiving an unexpected gift. When we hang on tight for later, just in case, show us that you are in this very moment. In these ways, teach us to give, to share, to offer ourselves for your kingdom's work. In Jesus' name, amen.
May God's love envelop you and embrace you and uphold you each day, each minute. And may you go forth to spread that love to all that you meet in word and deed.